Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Brent Berenson, and I will be the moderator for our presentation. I'm the director of FLOR's Office of Technology, which focuses on using science and innovative engineering technology to build a better world. Our engineers, designers, and experts, our people, are the core of our success. Today's webinar is entitled Using Economic Modeling to Analyze Energy Transition Project Profitability. The world is decarbonizing the current energy mix to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve sustainability. As part of this energy transition, understanding the economic viability and profitability of projects related to emerging technologies is of key importance. In this webinar, subject matter experts Aaron Arduin and Zach Weimer will provide a general overview of the energy transition with specific details on using ammonia as an energy vector. Then using a recent green ammonia project as the basis of a case study, they will highlight the development and application of techno-economic model to determine the most cost-effective solution for the facility. With us today is Zachary Weimer. Zach oversees Floor's commercial strategies for the Americas region across all of Floor's business lines. Based in Floor's Houston office, Zach has over 15 years of industry experience and has performed a variety of roles in engineering, construction, and supply chain. Zach has a degree in civil engineering from Texas A&M University and is a professional engineer in Texas. Outside of work, Zach enjoys traveling with his family, volunteering at Fort Bend ISD schools, and camping with his kids' scout troops. Joining Zach is Aaron Arduin. Aaron has over 15 years of industry experience in various areas, such as green energy to ammonia production, polyethylene production, acid gas removal, CO2 capture and sequestration, and utility and offsite systems. He's recognized as one of FLOR's experts in energy transition and electrolysis, and is currently leading the process engineering feasibility study efforts for a commercial scale green ammonia facility. Aaron has a Bachelor of Science degree in chemical engineering from McNeese State University. He lives in the Houston area and enjoys hiking, golfing, and spending time with friends and family. Floor has a very strong safety-driven culture, and as such, it's customary for us to start our meetings with a brief safety topic. Aaron, if you wouldn't mind, please unmute your line to share the safety topic with us. Thank you, Brent. As we are seeing a push for companies to reduce their carbon footprint, there is a call for increased reliability on renewable energy sources. One way to transport energy through the world and to reduce end-user carbon emission is through the use of hydrogen as an energy source. Electrolysis produces hydrogen via, via splitting water molecules using electricity and is positioned to provide a pathway of producing hydrogen from renewable and zero carbon energy sources. This safety incident occurred at a Laporte Industries Limited facility in the UK. The facility used an alkaline electrolyzer, which uses potassium hydroxide solution to produce hydrogen. Additionally, oxygen is a byproduct of the electrolysis process. The electrolytic cell is pressurized to 425 PSIG by a control valve on the hydrogen production line. The separating drums, shown here as two smaller drums above the larger electrolyzer stack, are fitted with liquid level indicators and are also provided with low-level float operated control valves. The control system is designed to discharge the gases to atmosphere as the liquid level is lowered to the initial action point. And if the level falls further, safety switches disconnect the power supply to the electrolyzer to prevent overheating damage and rupture. Based on the animation, you can see the typical flow and level of potassium hydroxide solution in the electrolyzer by following the red line. The green line indicates the flow of hydrogen. The light blue line indicates the flow of oxygen. And the darker blue line indicates the water addition to the system to make up for water that is separated to produce hydrogen. In years prior to the incident, high temperature and voltage readings were experienced in the cell resulting from sludge deposits, which cause blockages. Corrosion was seen on the partition walls 
of the cells adjacent to the gas offtake ducts and on the anode gauzes. Damaged items were replaced and the metallurgy was modified. On April 5, 1975, there was an explosion in the oxygen separator drum which ruptured. This liberated a large quantity of caustic solution which splashed on an operator and covered most of his body. The safety site procedures were followed and the operator was taken to the hospital where he passed away from his injuries. So what happened? Metallurgical evidence suggests that the oxygen separating drum ruptured at a pressure of around 2000 PSI and that damage was due to ignition. The stacks were dismantled after the incident. Certain electrolyte and gas passages were blocked with sludge. Crystalline potassium hydroxide deposits were seen on one plate, indicating gross overheating. Heavy sludge deposits were seen in some cells, along with surface pitting on the partition walls, with some partitions experienced on a hole right through the plate, as seen in the picture. Additionally, there was corrosion and erosion damage seen on the electrode gauzes and associated asbestos separators, which progressed to complete breakdown of the cell fabric. This caused an interconnection between the hydrogen and oxygen ducts. The hydrogen and oxygen mixed within the cell and separator drums and ignited. In an alkaline system, the initial reaction occurs at the cathode where electrons promote the dissociation of water forming hydrogen and hydroxide ions. The hydroxide ion passes through a diaphragm to release the electron and form oxygen and water at the anode. Due to the sequence of steps in forming hydrogen and oxygen within the cell, it was determined that the best indicator for potential explosion in the electrolytic cell is the oxygen period. Additionally, cell voltage and temperature checks, along with gas and electrolyte temperature, are used to give a long-term indication of the state of each cell. It is important to learn from safety incidents like this and ensure future designs have the appropriate process and safety controls and indicators. Today, we will discuss energy transition, followed by a discussion on the project pathway to produce green ammonia with keys to determine the most cost-effective solution for the facility. We will cover economic modeling of energy transition facilities, and we will end with a Q&A session. In this section, we will discuss aspects of energy transition and hydrogen as an energy vector through ammonia. So what is energy transition? As you can see, it is defined as a long-term structural change in energy systems. The topic tends to foster an emotional response in individuals in one of two ways, denial or embrace. So I wanted to provide some examples of historical changes in energy that we can all relate to. Can you imagine everyone still riding around in a horse and buggy? The transition to gasoline and diesel enhanced the ability to efficiently travel long distances. How about moving cargo across the world with sailing ships? The transition to fossil fuels enabled exploration and transportation of goods and people throughout the world. Although the use of fossil fuels contains advantages such as consistency and the ability to provide predictable energy, through time, we have experienced negative effects to our environment, such as the emission of additional quantities of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases to the environment. As technology enhancements have been and continue to be made, we as a species have the ability to transition portions of our fuel sources away from fossil fuels and into systems that use renewable energy to produce environmentally friendly fuel sources. Example of this, are fuel cell powered vehicles that use hydrogen as fuel and emit water vapor. Also, shipping vessels are being designed and built to use ammonia as their fuel source, which will emit water vapor and nitrogen. Lastly, our singular dependency on a finite resource seems to cause chaos in economic markets and prices of consumer goods during any interruptions in the supply chain. We all have been exposed to the arguments of climate change and the potential impacts of continuing to emit greenhouse gases over time. Notice in the pie chart by BP Statistical Review in 2020 that 85% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. 
At this rate, we continue to emit over 30 gigatons of carbon dioxide annually from our fossil fuel power sources. The other rationale for initiating a transition in energy is that our sustainability is currently linked to a finite resource. There have been discussions through the years on when our fossil fuel resources will be exhausted. All predictions have come and passed, but at the end of the day, the energy sources are not renewable. So, if we have the right conditions to initiate a transition to renewable energy sources, why not try? You can see on this slide some of the recent headlines indicating the level of interest in green hydrogen and green ammonia as an essential component of the energy transition. I've attended a number of conferences and discussions on the topic of energy transition, and what has been apparent is that all around the world, companies are reporting the ability to produce renewable energy from wind and solar at 1.2 to 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour which is interesting since a white paper published by Argus Media Group in 2020 states that the levelized cost of hydrogen would approach that of fossil fuel-based hydrogen when electricity prices drop below two cents per kilowatt hour. According to chemanalyst.com, the price of ammonia exceeded $900 per ton in December 2021, which provides ample opportunity for future green ammonia projects, which are suggested to currently be able to produce ammonia at approximately $650 per ton, according to numerous publications. Therefore, green hydrogen and or green ammonia as a fuel are prime candidates for areas of the economy that don't lend themselves to electrification, such as bunkering fuel for cargo ships. So while there is debate on how green hydrogen will be produced, for example, using electrolysis for renewables or nuclear, or on which industries will adopt these products, from agriculture to the production of green steel or bunkering fuel for ships, there is broad agreement that the market for these products is going to increase dramatically over the near term. If hydrogen serves as a future vector to transport energy for the world, what is the most economic way to transport hydrogen? Liquid ammonia provides the highest storage density of hydrogen when compared to other hydrogen carriers. 75% more hydrogen can be transported via liquid ammonia as compared with the same volume transported as liquid hydrogen. Additionally, liquid ammonia is stored at negative 33 degrees Celsius or negative 28 degrees Fahrenheit as compared to liquid hydrogen that is stored at negative 253 degrees Celsius or negative 423 degrees Fahrenheit. For reference, LNG is transported at negative 162 degrees Celsius and negative 260 degrees Fahrenheit. The Haber-Bosch process to synthesize ammonia from hydrogen and nitrogen feed streams is well established with over 100 years of development and implementation. There are numerous suppliers of the technology that range in production capacities from less than 200 tons per day to over 4,000 tons per day of ammonia production. Report advances in ammonia cracking technology demonstrate the ability to crack ammonia at temperatures below 400 C rather than above 700 C. The ability to crack ammonia into hydrogen and nitrogen at lower temperatures provides for more efficient operation with lower hydrogen losses, which aids the economics of producing, transporting, and storing ammonia as a hydrogen carrier and thus an energy vector for world, world use. These characteristics, along with established logistical infrastructure, design guidelines, and industry procedures positions green ammonia to be used as a vector to carry hydrogen for green energy needs across the world. Ship designers such as Breeze and Japan's NYK have designs for ammonia-powered ships. Man Energy Solutions has designed an ammonia-powered engine for shipping vessels, and companies such as Mitsui OSK Lines are purchasing shipping vessels powered by ammonia. In this section, we will discuss the project pathway to develop deliverables and data required to support the economic modeling. This flow diagram is intended to provide a visual depiction of the steps and key data points required to develop an accurate economic model for the facility. 
When developing the facility basis, one aspect that can be an important indicator regarding the electrolysis type technology type is the source of power and intermittency of the power source. As we learned in the April 2021 Innovation Builders presentation on hydrogen and electrolysis, alkaline systems traditionally have slower ramp times than PIM systems and can experience operational issues when exposed to load variations. Once the basis for this facility is developed, we move into the technology selection phase of the feasibility study. Requests for information or RFI documents are sent to each potential licensor to obtain data for evaluation. Responses to the RFI, especially for electrolysis suppliers, can, be, can vary greatly depending on the supplier. Numerous written clarifications and clarificational meanings can be required to understand the offer from each supplier and to assess any additional requirements for a comprehensive comparison. For example, hydrogen delivery pressure tends to vary with technology as alkaline systems tend to provide a lower delivery pressure and PIM systems a higher delivery pressure. But these delivery pressures vary depending on the supplier of the specific technology. Therefore, assessments will need to be made for additional equipment and power requirements to meet our hydrogen delivery pressure. Additionally, chilled water may be required by suppliers to aid in the dehydration of the product. These systems may not be supplied in the offer, so equipment and power requirements must be assessed for those systems. Also, alkaline systems require chemical addition of potassium hydroxide and vanadium pentoxide which adds to operational expenses for the facility. The goal of the technology evaluation is to have a comprehensive apples to apples assessment for each supplier based on the total capex and opex to produce the required hydrogen flow rate at the required delivery pressure set by the project. It is important to note that FLOOR has a proprietary method called the Integrated Process Systems Evaluation Technique or IP set which is used to systematically analyze technology offerings. IPSET is a method that accounts for all major items that impact the selection of a feed, process, or product by assigning weights to them and scores for various systems under consideration and totaling the composite score to establish a relative ranking. The IPSET is partitioned into four major sections, licensure qualifications, technical considerations, economic considerations, and commercial, commercial considerations. Each section is subdivided into multiple evaluation parameters, which allows clients to vary the weightings and individual scores to perform a sensitivity analysis to assess a relative ranking for all technology options in consideration. Once the technology evaluation is complete, the design for the balance of plant systems, such as cooling medium, water systems, power, storage, and loading can be finalized. Input to key deliverables that support the estimate and economic modeling stages for the project. With this general depiction, I plan to discuss some of the technical aspects of a green or zero carbon ammonia production facility. Inputs to the facility are renewable energy and seawater or non potable water. It is important to note that to meet certification requirements for green products, it appears that sourcing of renewable energy is required during all times of production. Also, we have shown nuclear on this diagram. Nuclear energy can provide a reliable zero carbon energy source that can be used as base load power for a facility. The January 2022 Innovation Builders presentation featured Fluor's new scale modular reactor. The recording is available on Fluor.com in case you're interested to know more. The water treatment system will produce utility potable and demineralized water for the facility. The electrolyzer require demineralized water quality with a conductivity of less than 0.1 microsiemens per centimeter for hydrogen production to minimize the degradation of the equipment. For, the, for hydrogen production, there are two main commercially proven electrolysis technologies at this time, alkaline water electrolysis and PIM, or polymer electrolyte membrane, or also known as proton exchange membrane. Also, there are two additional technologies emerging, which include high temperature electrolysis through the solid oxide electrolytic cell or SOEC technology, 
and another low temperature option with anion exchange membrane or AEM. For more information on green hydrogen production and electrolyzers, please see the Innovation Builders presentation from April 2021. Through previous studies and discussion, we have established relationships with multiple electrolysis providers throughout the world. When evaluating the appropriate hydrogen production system for your green ammonia facility, it is extremely important to obtain a deep understanding for the technology offerings from each supplier. As I stated in the previous slide, numerous clarifications and technical discussions are needed to obtain information on key aspects of the offering to create a comprehensive evaluation across all suppliers. We're in a period of technology development, especially with PIM, SOEC, and AEM electrolyzer systems. As you receive offers, it is important to understand the number of operating facilities with a similar stack and module size as what is being offered to your facility. Upon initial inspection of the technology offering from competing systems, power usage may seem advantageous for certain systems. It is important to factor in all power adjustments required by the system to meet the required hydrogen flow, outlet spec, and pressure. Additional utilities, utility systems, and power losses can account for significant increases in power requirements. We have encountered data reporting a power requirement of 52 kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen. When factoring in additional requirements by the balance of plant systems, the actual power requirement was more like 58 kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen, leading to a 12% increase in power over the reported value. Another important aspect of the evaluation is system flexibility. We have seen stable operating turnout capabilities ranging from 5% to 50%, depending on the supplier and technology type. Additionally, Startup, ramp up, and ramp down rates can vary drastically as some systems require 30 plus minutes to start up and have ramp times measured in minutes, where other systems start up within a few minutes and have ramp times measured in seconds. This portion of the, eva of the evaluation becomes increasingly important as you connect your hydrogen production system directly to the renewable energy source, such as solar or wind. Additional factors that support OPEX, such as chemical consumption, water treatment, et cetera, should be evaluated for input to the economic model. Differences in plot area and construction requirements can have substantial impacts on the electrolyzer capex. We have experienced systems of similar hydrogen production capacities requiring up to six times more plot area. This will have a large effect on the growth potential, construction costs, and additional site materials associated with the project. Once we have hydrogen available at pressure, we need nitrogen to feed the ammonia unit. Nitrogen free of impurities such as oxygen, argon, and carbon dioxide is required for ammonia synthesis. Therefore, a cryogenic nitrogen production unit is required for the facility. Similar assessments of technology offerings can be performed for the nitrogen production unit to ensure the most cost competitive provider is chosen. For the ammonia unit, a similar process is followed for the technology evaluation as what is done for the hydrogen production unit. The initial phase of most projects being announced is in an order of magnitude smaller than today's commercially available units at 3,000 to 4,000 tons per day of ammonia production. Therefore, it is important to evaluate multiple technology suppliers as we have seen certain technological advancements or advantages in the smaller units depending on the supplier. Once the major technology selections are complete, design of the balance of plant systems can be completed. The CapEx estimate is initiated once plot plan, equipment list, material estimates such as structural steel, concrete, and piping, power and electrical components, and constructability plans are finalized. The CapEx, OpEx, and financial components are used by our commercial strategy group, strategies group to develop a financial model to analyze the feasibility and key financial drivers for the project. And now I will turn it over to Zach to discuss FLOR's financial modeling capabilities. Thank you, Aaron, and good day, everyone. I'm going to be describing our project economic modeling process, which is a tool used to judge project viability using economic metrics 
and is particularly useful for energy transition projects that may not have well-established commercials relative to traditional forms of energy. Economic modeling of a project provides insights for decision makers and the screening of various options, technologies, and approaches. The model provides structure and relationships among the many variables. As we just saw in the case of hydrogen and ammonia, there are multiple technologies, many colors, and forms of production, each of which come with different initial costs, operating expenses, and production rates. To make a logical and consistent comparison, a levelized modeling approach is used. In this case, we're looking at the levelized cost of ammonia, referred to as LCOA. It's a measure of the average net present value of the ammonia production for a given plant configuration over its lifetime, expressed in terms of dollars per ton of ammonia. In other words, it's the lifetime project costs divided by the production amount over that lifetime. This approach is used for investment planning and to compare across different technologies, for example, PEM or alkaline electrolyzers, different energy sources, such as wind, solar, or nuclear, as well as options for project size, phasing, capacities, risk profiles, and returns. This modeling approach is very versatile and lends itself to simplified iterations and evaluations. Floor's integrated modeling capability coupled with the engineering technical teams, our estimating group, and the client allows for streamlined project evaluation and insights for decision makers. In addition to LCOA, the model also provides the project net present value, internal rates of return, payback periods, which we'll describe later. Across the project life cycle, project economic modeling is first set up in phase one, business planning and conceptual development, shown here on the lower right. As the business opportunities are identified, as you'll see later in this presentation, during, it's during phase two that the modeling can have the most impactful role for screening, evaluating, and selecting alternatives. The economic model can then live throughout the project for periodic checks of how the project actuals are measuring up to the targets. To begin the modeling process, certain key project parameters need to be identified for input. We refer to these as the techno-economic parameters because they have both a technical basis related to the facility function and the commercial definition of the project. Starting with the functional currency to be considered. For example, the project may be constructed in a local currency, yet the, project pro yet the product sales made in another currency, such as the US dollar. So the exchanges and currency used for the evaluation must be defined. The economic analysis period, as the name suggests, is the length of time for the modeling analysis period. Typically, this could range from 20 to 30 years. Next, we have the discount rate. Setting the discount rate isn't always straightforward and is highly specific to the company or entity that will own the project. While there are some rules of thumb, many companies will use the weighted average cost of capital, or WAC, as a proxy for the discount rate in the model. In situations where the new project is considerably more or less risky than the company's normal operations, it's advisable to add a risk premium to the discount rate. For example, to account for cases where the cost of capital is undervalued, where the project does not generate as much cash flow as expected. Power supply required and water consumption are determined from the technical team based on the process configuration. Capacity factor is the percentage of time in a year that the plant is operational. This accounts for planned maintenance, unplanned shutdowns, as well as the startup and ramp times that Aaron mentioned, as well as any power supply intermittency. Capacity factor is then used in determining the next item, which is operational hours per year. Annual inflation is used to account for the future cost or cash outlays, such as operation, operation staff wages and power costs. And finally, there's the rated ammonia output of the plant per year. Again, this comes from the process technology team. Once the basic techno-economic parameters are defined, we then move to the other major model inputs shown here. CapEx is derived from the capital cost estimate of the project, which is inclusive of the cost for plant equipment, materials, engineering, and construction. The inputs can be as basic or detailed as the current state of the estimate allows. OPEX are the operational costs, including the cost for power, water, chemicals, plant operations, and maintenance staff. 
Next are the financing considerations, such as equity debt ratios, interest rates on loans, or other project financial backings and associated costs. The project may consider incentives or benefits, such as tax abatements and renewable energy credits. And finally, there's the project revenue related to the sale of the product. In this case, we're looking at ammonia sales derived from hydrogen. I also want to highlight that these parameters can be input as variable functions over time. For example, you can see here in the chart on the right that electricity power supply cost can be input to vary over the analysis period. In this example, the electricity supply contracts are expected to be renewed at certain intervals in the future and are expected to decline as, the step, as a step function shown here. Additionally, there is flexibility to run different cases for variables such as high, low, and targets to see how they affect the project economics. With an array of technologies currently on the market and many emerging onto the market, it's important to be able to evaluate them on a levelized basis across the project lifecycle. It's not easy to tell on the surface how the variations in construction cost, power consumption, operations and maintenance, and production output of a particular technology at a certain site location will drive the project economics. The Economica model allows for this assessment. For example, lower upfront capital cost of a particular electrolyzer technology may initially be quite attractive, but higher operating costs may diminish that advantage over time. Likewise, a higher initial equipment cost may be offset by higher production output of the facility and still result in an acceptable payback. A tornado chart such as this is generated to further assess the key variables that are driving variation to the LCOA and to what degree. This brings visibility to project teams and clients of the areas needing particular focus and the critical aspects of the project, such as electricity usage and capacity factor. For example, assumptions of what the electricity cost will be may lead to conservatism, where in fact a site-specific study to evaluate market cost from the energy providers is warranted. I'll point out that certain items such as CapEx can be broken down further in the sensitivity analysis down to the level of detail provided in the estimate. For example, CapEx can be broken out into material costs, electrolyzer cost, air separation unit cost, labor cost, and land acquisition to see how each of those impacts the LCOA individually. This gives insight to know what aspects of the project may need further study, development, or optimization. Further parametric sensitivity analysis can be performed for particular variables and, how, and their effect on the internal rate of return, net present value, and payback periods. Here are two examples of that showing how the ammonia sales cost, which forms the project revenue, affects the payback period as well as how the electricity purchase cost of the facility affects the payback period. As you can see on the chart on the right, as the cost of electricity increases in the model, the payback period also increases. These variable sensitivities can be particularly, particularly useful to hone in and focus on aspects of the project that will have the greatest economic impacts or risks. Model results are in the form of net present value, internal rate of return, payback period, and investment turnover ratio. Net present value is the difference between the present value of cash inflows and the present value of cash outflows over a period of time. NPV is the result of calculations used to find today's value of a future stream of payments. If the NPV of a project or investment is positive, it means that the discounted present value of all future cash flows related to that project or investment will be positive and therefore attractive. The internal rate of return is an estimate of the profitability of the potential investment or project. IRR is the rate that makes the net present value of all cash flows equal to zero in a discounted cash flow analysis. IRR must be greater than the discount rate, and as we discussed earlier, the discount rate may be a particular entity's working average cost of capital for the project to be attractive. Payback period refers to the amount of time it takes to recover the costs of an investment. The investment turnover ratio compares the revenues of the project to its debt and equity over time. The ratio is used to evaluate the ability of a project or investment to generate revenue from that specific amount of funding. 
The higher the investment turnover ratio, the more efficient the investment is in generating revenues from the debt and equity capital invested. The benefits of economic modeling with an engineering procurement and construction company such as Floor is the ability to integrate the modeling with the process engineering, estimating, and commercial teams to evaluate not just the upfront initial project cost, but the lifetime cost and cash flows over time of various technologies and options for the project. Furthermore, it provides focus on key variables going into later phases to improve or maintain economic goals and mitigate risks. Project stakeholders such as financial institutions, private equity, corporate management, as well as outside entities such as governments and regulatory bodies are looking for robust economic evaluations for energy transition projects to gain support and make decisions on which projects to pursue and move forward. Aaron, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thanks, Zach. And to summarize what we presented today, one of Floor's key fundamentals in our focus is our focus on safety and our designs. Also, we discussed the transition to increase our use of renewable energy sources is viable to minimize our dependency on fossil fuels. Additionally, physical properties, existing infrastructure, and established handling guidelines position ammonia to play a key role as a vector for hydrogen and energy. We reviewed the pathway and key engineering deliverables required to support project economics and key technical aspects of licensed technology evaluations, selections, and facility design. Zach demonstrated the aspect of economic modeling, identification of key drivers through the development of tornado charts, and project feasibility through net present value, internal rate of return, payback period, and investment turnover ratio. Now I will turn it back over to Brent. Thank you, Aaron and Zach. Let's take a moment to address the questions we've received from the audience. This first question is for Zach. For hydrogen um, ammonia projects, are there industry indexes or resources that can assist with market costs? Uh, thank you for the question. I assume that this relates to the market costs for the, um, the sales of the ammonia to the market. Um, there are some uh, references. There's some uh, historical information. Uh, green ammonia is relatively new to the market. So uh, the amount of uh, green premium or uh, the pricing of green ammonia is not well established, but, but there are some, uh, some case studies and some uh, references out there that can be used. All right, thank you. Um, Zach, another question for you. Uh, ammonia is a worldwide commodity. So projects cannot assume a go if the predicted cost of electrolyzer based ammonia is vastly different than the worldwide market price. So how is this being factored and electricity cannot be free? Yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. So like I mentioned, the, the green ammonia market is, is a new market. It's, it's an establishing market, very different than the, the ammonia market of today, which is primarily used for fertilizer production and, and not as an energy source. So uh, that's why it's important to um, look at various cases of uh, sales costs of ammonia and, and how they affect uh, the project economics. So um, one cannot just assume that the price of ammonia today will be uh, the, the same or relative to a green ammonia market. And so this modeling approach allows you to look at various cases, uh, a wide range of potential ammonia costs and how they affect the project economics. All right, thank you. Um, the next question is for Aaron. Since it appears you've done a substantial electrolysis evaluation, can you comment on which technology provides the best offer at this time? Good question. Um, well, I'd like to start out by saying that all the technologies have a place in the market and it truly depends on um, a number of client site project specific factors to determine which technology should be chosen for a project. So I can probably provide some guidance in a general nature uh, for the question. Uh, like for instance, traditionally the alkaline electrolysis technology has a lower 
capital cost, higher efficiency, but operates with a lower current density, produces hydrogen at a lower pressure, and has slower response times. Where PIM typically has a higher current density, operates at a higher pressure, and has faster response times, but tends to have a higher capital cost and lower conversion efficiency. So if a client has a facility with a finite production requirement, plenty of space and can connect to a stable power source, such as the grid, hydroelectric or nuclear, then an alkaline system may be more optimum for that facility. But if a client is restricted on space and has a goal of expansion, has potential varying power, such as directly connected to renewables like wind and solar, then a PIM system may be more appropriate for that facility. Um, it, it really comes down to working with clients and understanding the project motivations, constraints, and drivers to properly select the correct hydrogen production technology type and licensor or supplier. Um, I think this is where Fluor can provide a, a great value to our clients. So I, I hope that that helps to answer the question and then thank you for the question. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, the next question is for Zach. Have you, have you used this uh, economic modeling approach for other emerging or newly commercialized technologies? Yes, yeah, so this, this modeling approach can be used for uh, a wide range of industries and products. Um, particularly, it's used uh, when evaluating renewable uh, electricity sources. Uh, in, in that case, we refer to it as LCOE or levelized cost of electricity. Um, so it's it's widely used uh, um, in the industry for energy transition products. All right, thank you. Um, let's see, I'll open this one up to either of you to respond. <clears throat> Excuse me. I noticed that for these green projects, there are four main sources of critical electrical energy. It seems half of these four electrical sources presented, wind slash solar, have arguable reliability issues. How significantly does the electrical reliability impact plant operating percent or on stream time, and thus overall financial viability of these, tech, of these facilities? Uh, Zach, I think I can start on that one. So, yep. so you know, in, in certain areas of the world, such as, uh, let's say, Chile, Saudi Arabia, Sahara Desert, Australia, um, Death Valley here in the U.S., you know, the, the solar is very predictable, right, over periods of time. Um, one thing that has been suggested is that since the cost of renewable energy can be predictable for long periods of time and the climate can in in these certain areas of the world can be predictable over long periods of time then you could essentially establish a cost base for your green hydrogen and ammonia in these in these locations and have a very stable cost base for your product through a long period of time, let's say the life cycle of the project. So there, there are some advantages. The key is if you're gonna have a situation where you're connecting to renewable energy, you wanna pick the right location on the globe, right? And Aaron, I'll, I'll add to that, that uh, plant capacity factor or operational time is a critical component to project economics. You, you have to be making product to be able to pay back the investments and generate cash flows. So uh, downtime due to reliability of the energy source is uh, a major influence uh, of the project economics. And, and therefore, uh, we, we, we can and, and have evaluated uh, projects that may have uh, backup sources or alternative sources of uh, electricity, such as um, maybe during the nighttime, they will draw from the grid uh, at a different cost basis. So, so we can actually input uh, varying cost bases for uh, daytime and nighttime power into the model and, and see the effects that that has. All right, thank you. Thanks for that response. Um, 
Next question I'll address to Aaron. Um, does FLOOR offer the IP set technology assessment as a standalone service? Yes, uh, actually we, we've been working with a client and we're kicking off a, um, a study for uh, an electrolysis um, supplier uh, at the moment. So yes, we do offer that as an engineering effort and a service. All right, thank you. Um, and Aaron, another one for you. Um, you talked about using ammonia as a carrier for hydrogen since it is uh, since it needs less volume and doesn't have to be as cold. But what about using pipeline for hydrogen? That's a great question. Yes, we're uh, we're we're definitely looking at at pipeline hydrogen. Um, I'm not an expert in that field, but there is going to be a discussion. Uh, on the innovation builders uh, or an innovation builders presentation next month in April on hydrogen pipeline specifically. So I, what I would suggest is let's uh, we we should tune into that one for an answer on that question. All right, thank you. Let's see. The next question is for Zach. Do we have a target IRR that Floor applies for different types of projects? When developing the economic model, uh, there's no particular target IRR. That's that's highly dependent on uh, an owner's uh, commercial targets that they need to achieve uh, either for their stakeholders or um, uh, returns. Um, it's important that the IRR again uh, be greater than the the discount period or their working average cost of capital uh, with some margin, and and that margin is that risk premium. Uh, that may be applied to the analysis. Okay, thank you. Um, next question I'll address to Aaron. What if you place a hydrogen production unit at at the uh, commercial nuclear power plant so that you produce then store on site? Will this uh, on the same with this on the same site, you would have a gas turbine generation unit to produce peaker power. All of this occurring on site so that you don't have over the road transportation cost. Um, I, I'm not sure I actually understand the question. Can, I, I, if the question is, can it be done? Then the answer is yes. And, and I'll follow up to that is we've, we've done uh, some analysis on uh, gas turbine generators fired by hydrogen only and there are um, advancements in that technology occurring uh, by multiple companies, and so we we've done a we've done a power study to look at that, and that was and yes, that is we are capable of doing that. Yeah, and and I'll add to that a, a key variable when you when you talk about hydrogen or ammonia storage is is the amount of storage and the length of time of that storage. Um, near term storage or intermittent storage is uh, generally uh, is generally okay, but when you start talking about longer term storage, there is a diminishing returns uh, because you have to keep the product cool and uh, the cost and size of the storage can be detrimental to the economics. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is for Aaron. Your safety topic addressed an incident with an alkaline water electrolysis system. Are there inherent safety advantages or disadvantages? among the available electrolysis technologies? Um, I think, you know, at the end of the day, you are working with typically pressurized hydrogen. So there's always uh, some safety concerns or risks around that. Um, with the with the alkaline system, as we said before, you have the, um, the caustic solution, the potassium hydroxide solution, and the vanadium pentoxide that's needed, which is hazardous. So um, I think that those two substances, when we do evaluations on plants, it, some clients are, are worried, you know, and, and have concerns around operators, uh, um, you know, managing systems like that. So it, it's something, it's, it's really client to client, but yeah, there, we do obviously have the chemical substances required for the alkaline systems that that is different from the other systems. All right, thanks. And another question for you, Aaron. 
Uh, your graphic on the complex general concept included desalination and water treatment. If you have a municipal water or source of water, can you eliminate this unit? Well, like we said, the, the electrolyzers require a, uh, a conductivity of, of around 0.1, anywhere from, you know, 1 to 0.1 micro Siemens per centimeter. So to get on the, uh, to that level, you really need to go all the way to deionization. Now, if, if you have, uh, let's say a municipality water, like a potable water coming in from a, from a city, uh, source, then, um, then, you know, the initial RO treatment on that portion of the water is not needed. Uh, so it does, it does change maybe the quantity of water you need to treat to the, the high spec for conductivity. Um, so that, that's kind of how that would change. And that may be some of the analysis that needs to be done is, um, you know, the cost of purchasing uh, treated water versus the cost of installing that capacity for treatment within the plant and, and self-treating. All right, thank you. Um, next question again for Aaron. With the expectation that ammonia is a carrier of the future, are EPC contractors and licensors partnering to provide solution? And does FLOR have such a partnership? There are certain EPC companies that have technologies in that realm uh, that are partnering. Um, FLOR has remained technology neutral in this area, um, which provides some basic benefits, right? So we, we are technology neutral for ammonia technology and hydrogen production technology, which means we do not have any technologies that, uh, that compete on the open market. Um, being technology neutral in both of these areas provides us the ability to have an unbiased evaluation for technology selection. So FLOR's main objective is to select the most optimum technology offering for our clients and projects. And I think that is the, the biggest benefit of for our clients is to stay technology neutral and be able to work with anyone's technology offering. Okay, thanks. And uh, sorry to pick on you again, Aaron, but another one for you. Um, what advantages does a client have in coming to FLOR for a technology evaluation for ammonia and ammonia unit? Okay. Um, well, I'd like to start off by saying that FLOR has over 30 years of experience with ammonia synthesis. Now, most of this comes from the gray ammonia projects, which use natural gas as feedstock to produce hydrogen for the ammonia synthesis loop. Um, but the portions of the facility that make up the ammonia synthesis section remain virtually unchanged for the green ammonia system. And uh, as I said before, as I said before on the prior question about being technology neutral, you know that that does give our clients the benefit of uh, us being unbiased in our selection, right? And um, so lastly, being a global engineering company, we can work with licensor processes, design packages to successfully integrate the different systems together for the entire project. So you, we don't necessarily have to work or a client does not necessarily have to choose uh, the electrolysis provider with the ammonia provider coming from the same entity. We, we have the ability to evaluate the most cost effective solution for each of those technologies for the client's facility. Um, and, um, you know, th this includes all phases. We floor is able, as Zach shown on a previous slide, we, we're able to, to work in all phases of the project from feasibility through basic and detailed engineering, procurement, construction, and commissioning and startup. So I think that's an advantage for floor for our clients. All right, thank you, Aaron. Um, and one more for you. Um, why is water shown to feed the ammonia plant and the ASU? Um, meant as boiler feed water, perhaps? Yes. The main feed, oh, sorry, uh, yeah. main feed water is to the electrolyzer. Okay, yeah, so, so 
we just try to represent all the flavors of water at that location. So for instance, uh, you'll have boiler feed water and some cooling water needed at the ammonia plant. You'll need cooling water needed at the air separation plant, most likely. So that, that was the, the, the premise from that is to show all the flavors of water coming out from that unit. Okay, thank you. It looks like that's all the time we have remaining for questions. Um, thank you again, Aaron and Zach for this very informative webinar and the time that you've spent today in preparation. Thank you to our audience for attending today. It's been a pleasure being your moderator. Although we're still finalizing the exact date, we will be hosting our next webinar in April. In this webinar, Floor Fellow David Chang will discuss hydrogen storage and pipeline transportation design challenges and other considerations. Please continue to stay informed of these events, including the date for David's webinar by visiting the Innovation Builders page on floor.com or by following our social media channels using hashtag Innovation Builders. If you'd like us to send you an email notifications of future webinars, please email us at innovation.builders at floor.com with opt-in in the subject line. We appreciate your attention and thank you again for dialing in today. We'll send out a compiled list of the Q&As within a few days, along with a notification that the webinar recording is available for replay on floor.com. If you have any questions or require additional information, please email innovation.builders at floor.com and someone from our team will get back to you. From all of us on the Innovation Builders team, have a safe day. Mm -hmm.